So let's start with an issue that's still very close to us, even though we're about a year away from when the book was released. Mm -hmm. The title is Genius, False Choices, The Faux Feminism of Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now that's the large title, but underneath that there's a subheading of Elite White Feminism Gave Us Trump and It Needs to Die. There's a lot to unpack there. So what is this brand of elite white feminism that delivered the White House to that guy? Right. Well, I mean, this is both a, a historical and a current problem, okay. right? I mean, that, um, that um, it's, it's long been the case that women's movements in the United States have been um, dominated by um, elite white people um, because Elite white people have dominated Every everything, yes. so it's, you know this is not unique to feminism, right? right? Um, so, um, but um, you know we saw that in in particular, um, it, it, we saw it, we saw the way that it played out in this in this recent election, where um, a lot of um, a lot of um, very privileged um, white women um, championed Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, often at the expense, uh, um, at the expense during the primary, of what um, of what many people considered a more progressive campaign, the campaign of Bernie Sanders, right. that would have actually, um, uh, you know, built a kind of politics that would have benefited more people, you know, advocating single single payer health care, right. free college, and um, you know things that would actually um, benefit more women mm -hmm. and and more working class women, more women of color. Um, so, um, so what we and we saw a kind of um, um, in in the way that um, the um, establishment feminism put all its hopes into Hillary Clinton. Um, also, a kind of ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, that um, you know, this was this was a world that um, you know just couldn't really reflect on the fact that um, you know she she couldn't just talk to um, rich donors in the Hamptons. You know that that's um, that kind of feminism was not going to carry the day in mass politics. She mm -hmm. needed to get out there, talk to waitresses and laid off workers in Ohio um, and um, and Wisconsin. She didn't even go to Wisconsin. Yeah. You know, so 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 I think you know we um, w what we saw was a kind of. Um, um, a, um, a a kind of politics. I think you can also call it neoliberal feminism, a kind mm -hmm. of feminism of the of the current status quo of the um, of the uh, um, contemporary capitalist status quo that wants to more or less leave things as they are, but have a few women at the top. So, and that's not going to win the day for the majority of women. Are we at the sort of nascence of this uh, post? HRC brand of feminism, you think? I hope so. I see some hopeful signs that we are. Yeah. Um, for one thing, we're seeing um, new kinds of leaders emerging. Um, you know, um, women like um, Linda Sarsour, um, Arab American woman who has been on the forefront of recent women's organizing, like the Women's March, right. for instance. Um, we're seeing. Um, well, we've been seeing all along the prominence of women in movements like Black Lives Matter, right. um, and now moving into um, uh, you know other um, other realms of, of political organizing as well. Um, you know, so so I think we're we're seeing um, we're seeing new leadership emerging, which is great, um, and I think um, we're also seeing new kinds of political tactics. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the um, the, the women's march was great, but um, the women, the international women's strike was pretty interesting too. Yeah. Now that's an event that happens every year on International Women's Day, but this time a lot of women in the United States really participated, which was very, um, which which does not usually yeah. happen. But in the spirit of that, if we're talking about new leadership, new tactics, there was something that you wrote that I actually made note of. We should work especially to help existing feminist efforts that that are squarely focused on women's material realities. Yeah. What are some of those material realities? Give a name to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, um, so um, 
unequal pay on the job um, is a material reality faced um, by um, huge numbers of women, um, harassment on the job, sexual harassment, um, the, um, um, a, um, a huge um, wealth gap between mm -hmm. um, in female owned households versus uh, female headed households versus male headed households um, we um, w we see um, struggles over um, over being able to afford health care which is of course not um, a, only a gender issue but falls disproportionately on women as the caretakers of children and of older people um, and and of having higher health costs because all our complicated parts, yeah. um, and <laughs> so the uh, um, so you know you see um, a lot of material realities. Women hold um, a, a higher portion of the student debt in this country. Mm -hmm. um, so um, women's material realities are um, 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 are exactly the right um, right right thing to be focusing on um, in this conversation, and um, the question of. Of representation, mm -hmm. or of whether we um, have a woman at the at the top or a woman president, um, I think it's got to be um, pretty low down on the list for most women compared to those material realities. But it was such a rallying cry, maybe for this pantsuit nation, as yes. you sort of pointed out, where that became the central focus. But yeah. if we're looking at what you call these reality uh, material realities, you noted equal pay, this workplace harassment. Uh, the health care issue as well as the just regular wellness and all these student mm -hmm. loans. So I wonder where the common ground between this sort of elitist brand of pantsuit nation feminism mm -hmm. is and this sort of groundswell idea of people who've been doing the work and not even realizing that they might fall under this moniker of feminist. Where, where do those things break? If wealth mm -hmm. isn't as big an issue for those women who've made it and put all these cracks in the glass ceiling, where is the common denominator for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good question. And I think um, one of the reasons, um, perhaps, that um, abortion rights has mm -hmm. loomed so large in feminist conversations um, is because of that um, that idea that well that equalizer. that that affects all women. Right. Um, but it actually doesn't affect all women the same way. Hmm. I mean, because the um, the affordability and access of abortion uh, to abortion has been. Uh, I mean that um, that has been in complete disarray um, for um, for decades, right. and um, even while um, you know the uh, establishment feminists can say, well, look, we, it's still legal, sure, but you know if you live in a rural area, it's you like can affordable housing, yeah, right? exactly. it's affordable to those who can afford it. Exactly. So, um, so I, I think it actually is important to be conscious of. You know, in the 80s, um, um, there, um, there's, people started referring to um, feminisms rather than feminism mm -hmm. r as a whole gotcha. to sort of um, gesture to the idea that, um, that people might see these issues in different ways and people, some things might be more urgent. Um, to some groups of women than others. Um, that said, but I think that I think that, um, um, I, I think that um, more. I, I would actually argue that um, um, the issues that affect more people, the material issues, the um, the issues that affect um, the ordinary woman, um, are the issues that should dominate um, the, um, the the feminist movement. Um, and um, and that um, the elite leadership should get on board with that. But if they don't, yeah. they should be overtaken by other um, emerging leaders. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, and and that you know it really, it has to be a mass movement. And particularly mm -hmm. in the age of Trump, I mean, um, we couldn't accelerate that mass movement <laughs> fast enough. But what are these emerging leaders going to inherit? Looking at this landscape now in that age of Trump, what are they facing down? And even internally, with all of the factionalism in feminisms and mm -hmm. feminism, mm -hmm. how do they move forward with all of the cracks that are showing themselves more and more? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, I, I mean I think that one way is to um, is to is to situate feminism as um, as 
um, a movement that has much in common with other movements that are emerging. I mean, we see um, young voters. Um, that, um, my nation colleague Sarah Leonard just had a piece in the um, in the New York Times why young voters are flocking to old socialists, <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. like the you know we see we're we're seeing an emergence of um, of the left, mm -hmm. you know, here here as well as in Britain, um, and that um, and and I think that feminism would do well to um, to situate itself. In that context, that it's um, that it, it should be it sh it should be a movement of the left. It should be a movement of the ordinary person, um, and, um, and and you know, and that when these different movements on the left, whether um, feminism, socialism, gay liberation, um, 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 come together instead of working against each other, um, we can be a lot stronger. So in, uh, in the collection that you edited, uh, False Choices in the Faux Feminism book, mm -hmm. there's a lot uh, made mention about statistics, the fact that Hillary scored mm -hmm. lower with black voters than mm -hmm. turned out in 2012, which is like the Obama factor. So OK, we'll, like, mm -hmm. yeah. we'll wink at that. Yeah, yeah. But That's the fact that Trump got fewer votes than Mitt Romney did. Mm -hmm. so. There's also still this through line of the fact that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Yes. But we have Bernie talking about how horrible the campaign was and mm -hmm. some of the writers in your collection saying how bad it is. So I wonder yeah. if the brand of feminism, whether it's fractured or not, and just collectively, if we could instead focus that energy yeah. on destroying the patriarchal, anachronistic way that we put people into the White House. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, I think yes, that's right. We, but I think that it is important mm -hmm. to criticize um, neoliberal feminism and say, look, you know, the, um, the you know the the kind of feminism that she represented, um, you know, throwing millions of poor women off of mm -hmm. welfare, um, you know, the, um, the this um, this um, pro mass incarceration. Um, th this this kind of this this kind of policy that um, that that she advocated um, for throughout the 90s and mm -hmm. throughout her campaign um, is, um, um, is 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 not progressive and not feminist unless you are defining feminism very very narrowly. Um, but um, and it's important to criticize that and it is important to note the way that those um, th um, that that th those um, elitist blinders. Hurt her campaign, um, but on the other hand, I also think that you're right. You know that that the the feminist movement should say also say, look, you know this was very flawed, and we can learn from it. But also, Hillary won the popular vote, so obviously, feminism, you know, in the most general and flawed and warts and all way, yeah. um, has a large constituency. You know, yeah. I mean, given that you know that people that many people wanted to vote for a woman. Women, um, to be president of the United States, um, um, you know, um, you know, despite the fact that she didn't go to Wisconsin and all that stuff. Yeah, but it's like I'm stealing a page mm. from my radical queer theory book to dismantle systems yes. instead of attacking mm. the That's people right. who are mm -hmm. the representatives. So that being said, what is the place, and how can these neoliberal feminists best serve the movement? Do they just mm -hmm. need to sit down? Or what skills can they bring to bear that can advance ideas and material issues that may not necessarily be their own? Mm -hmm. um, that is a good question. I think they have to do a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and there again, I think. So back to the sit down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, um, but at the same time, yeah. I mean, I, I, think they, I, I think they have to do a lot of listening, and I think they have to do a lot of coalition Building, um, you know, w with other people. Um, I think the um, as as a movement, we we really need to think about what kinds of institutions um, build um, mass power, you know, build, and can build um, power for working class women. Um, my friend um, Jane McAlevey, who's a labor organizer and a writer, um, always says, "We have a women's movement, mass women's movement already. It's called the labor movement, and it's like that's actually true. Um, and th there are, um, and that is a, um, a huge. Uh, there's a huge potential to build feminist power um, in the labor movement within labor unions. 
Um, and, um, and when you look at some of the most dynamic labor organizing, um, it comes from um, women-dominated unions like the Chicago Teachers Union, for example. Mm. Um, or, uh, and when you look at some of the uh, most amazing labor leaders, they're like Baravi Desai of the Taxi Workers Union here yeah. in New York. You know, Strong know. female voices. Yes, yes. So, um, so, so I think there's also um, a lesson to, um, to look for the feminist movement and build it in some of these under, unexpected and undersung places as well. So we'll begin where we are. <laughs> yes. Liza Featherstone, thank you so much for sitting down with us on VK Lab. We appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me.